Welcome to the Ironman Insider presented by Martin. I am your host, Matt Lieto. I am super stoked for our second episode, mostly because I like talking, talking about Ironman, getting behind the personalities, but we are super lucky to have a guest that I've got a lot to talk about, so we're going to get straight to it, our defending Vinfast Ironman world champion, Lucy Charles Barclay. How's it going, Lucy? Yeah, it's really good. I'm uh, coming to you from a very sunny part of the world, as you can probably see. I'm currently in the south of France. So yeah, super stoked to be on the podcast. And I know the first guest was a big hit. So I'm hoping I can um, do just as good a job as Sam laid on the first episode. Uh, Well, you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the episode, but spoiler, we both referenced your 70.3 world championship win as the most impressive 70.3 performance we'd ever seen. So Sam gave you a a good nod there. Oh, well, that's very nice to hear from a fellow champion. So uh, yeah, still probably one of my favorite days racing that one in St. George. Oh, uh, unreal. And I, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about it. It is, uh, again, I think the most impressive 70.3 70.3 performance I'd ever seen and to do it on a world championship stage was like, it's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. And, uh, have you been, uh, you've been keeping an eye on the, on the pro series stuff? Yeah, for sure. I've been definitely watching and enjoying whilst doing some of my training on the indoor trainer, watching the pro series. And obviously we just had Hamburg at Hamburg yeah. at the weekend and to see Jackie do the performance that she did and such an emotional finish that she had was just so lovely to see. And I'm so stoked for her. So, um, yeah, what a great performance that was. Yeah. And I, I yeah, it was insane. And she hadn't raced a Ironman since 2015, I think they had a couple of kids since then, but is there a woman on the circuit that doesn't see that performance and like be stoked that Jackie won. Like she's so, I can't imagine that. Yeah. I can't imagine there isn't one woman who isn't stoked for her. I mean, just to know that she's had two kids, she's had such a hiatus from doing Ironman and then to come back and put down that level of performance. It just shows that I guess there's no, there's no time limit on performance. Like you can keep coming back and yeah, just put down a performance like that. I think we're all just absolutely buzzing for her. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's surprising and it's not, the only reason it would be surprising is because we haven't seen her race that distance in a long time, but, and often when you see like a 70.3 specialist, it's because they're young and they're upcoming. But I think the year 2014, she did like five Ironman races. Like she knows how to race Ironman. She just hasn't put her hat in that ring. So, um, yeah. Were you, were you surprised at all by like how impressive, like 252 first Ironman in almost 10 years. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I think I, I definitely was surprised, but I guess I've kind of come to learn that you never write off any athlete in this. And I always knew that Jackie had a strong run on her, but to be able to put down a 252 after such a long period of time not racing Ironman, I think it's just so incredible. So um, yeah, like I said, I'm just buzzing for her. And I think that that will hopefully give her that confidence boost and then she can just kind of run with it and hopefully put down some more performances like that. And we won't be uh, writing her off anymore. We'll be thinking we've got to watch out for Jackie. No, and I, I, I should I should know these times, but you know if you haven't raced in ten years and she went eight nineteen, I imagine that's a pretty big uh, pretty big PR boost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, impressive. I mean that's definitely one of the fastest Ironman times for a female, anyway. So uh, yeah, she's pretty much up there now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, you know, what do you uh, what do you do with that FOMO? Um, you said you're in the uh, a warm part of the world, south of France. What do you uh, what do you got going on? Yeah, so I'm currently training. I'm staying between Nice and Antibes, so I'm doing a little bit of a training camp here, um, enjoying the warmer weather. I've also been out on the Ironman bike course. I was super lucky to have Marjolaine and Clement take me out on the whole course oh, the other cool. day. They yeah. gave up their entire day for me, so super grateful to them. And yeah, they showed me basically their home road so uh they know it really really well and um it's absolutely brutal but so beautiful as well so uh yeah i had a really good time riding with them the other day yeah i mean it just and i love that you are there like for training camp like that's that's where you would go to do a training camp right isn't it amazing yeah i guess i've never i think i came and trained out here in 2019 leading into the 70.3 world champs um but I haven't really been back since. And now I really am scratching my head as to why I've not been coming here to train with the 
amazing roads. I mean, we kind of said today, France is pretty much the home for cycling with the Tour de France. So um, you can understand why when you get out on these bike, on these roads and you don't see a car and you just see, yeah, beautiful landscape and amazing climbs. It's It's been amazing to see. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, and uh, any reason in particular you're uh, in that part of the world besides going on a long ride with uh, those two uh, wonderful hosts? Yeah, well, I guess I have decided to race uh, Ironman France, which is in a couple of weeks. Um, Sweet. So I thought I'd come out and suss the course before. And um, yeah, I've been really, I guess I've been very warmly welcomed to the area. I've actually been swimming with the anti swim team who have been putting me through my paces. I'm not usually at the back of a lane in swim training and these swimmers are serious swimmers. So no I've been swimming with them, but getting put through my paces and yeah, just cycling the local roads here and running along the promenade. It's been amazing. So yeah, the, the feeling is very good at the moment. Awesome. And uh, stoked to hear you going for an Ironman race. I mean, the last time I saw you, you're, lower leg was blue <laughs> you know i think uh a couple of days post kona at my at my brother's house so like that injury is feeling good and now you're you're confident to go the the full distance um yeah i was i think that was one of the main things at the start of the season was i was still recovering from that injury i basically had um a grade four c tear in my calf which um the only thing worse than that is pretty much if you're in a car accident in terms of tearing the muscle. So it was a really extreme tear that I did. Um, I had to have a total of 16 weeks off of running after Kona. So um, that was, I guess, where I was in a, a difficult place because I wasn't sure how well my body would come back to racing after that level of injury. So I had to be very cautious. Um, and then I guess my season has got off to a really good start. And that has given me the scope to be able to go and race a full Ironman and um, see how the body goes over that distance. And I guess just remembering that that's what got me into the sport. So I felt like I, I wanted to go and do another Ironman and see how much I could test myself. Uh, that's awesome. And uh, we need to get back to that calf tear because there's so much I need to, <laughs> to hear about that and what I witnessed on that day where that occurred. But um, no, that's, that's awesome. So what about, I mean, obviously the, the Ironman France course is legendary and it was kind of before the world championships was there too. Is there anything specifically about that course that you think suits you or challenges you in a way now? Like obviously finding challenges, having won the world championship is probably, uh, probably more difficult than it has been. Yeah. I think getting into the sport, it was all about trying to find the biggest challenge, which was why I was an athlete that instantly came into the sport and just decided that I was going to do Ironman. And then I guess I, I had some early su success in that distance, but I just loved the challenge more than anything else. And my first Ironmans were Ironman UK, then Ironman Lanzarote, both notoriously tough Ironman. Right. So um, I know that I love a tough course. Um, going out and riding the entire course the other day, I did feel like you deserve a medal just for doing the bike. Um, was scratching my head as to people have to run a marathon after this. So I am really looking forward to that challenge. I think it's something that excites me. And I do just love to race when you're like, actually, I don't even know if I can do this. Um, having done a lot of Ironlands, I'm sure I'll be able to. And I'm sure the crowds here I've heard are very, very good in France. So I'm looking forward to witnessing that. But yeah, it's going to be a really tough day out and I'm looking forward to it. And do you think that that course suits kind of your your strength um, as being kind of a front front runner? Yeah, like I think it's definitely going to be. Bike. Yeah, it's going to be one of those courses where I don't really think it matters where you're positioned. It's going to be very much an individual effort. This, you're not going to get towed around on the bike. You've got to be able to climb. You've got to be able to descend. You've, you've got to be confident on your bike. It's going to be probably one of the biggest elements of the day for sure. Um, so yeah, I think it's all about being gritty and being tough. And that's something that I feel like I've always kind of had within me when I've been racing since I was young, I guess. Yeah, no, you've definitely shown uh, a lot of grit. Um, and this course, yeah, it, it certainly tests a pretty similar, you know, if you look at the, the numbers, pretty similar to, uh, Lanzarote as far as like maybe a little bit more climbing, but the run is similar, right? Yeah, I'd say it definitely is similar. And I'm, I've always loved to go and train in Lanzarote as well. So it gave me similar memories to kind of doing that Ironman, but I think that the course here is 
it just feels tougher, but I'm not sure if that's because it feels like you're climbing for longer in one climb because in Lanzarote, the climbs aren't right. quite as, as, um, as high. So although you do almost a similar amount of climbing, I feel like it just feels tougher here because you just feel like I've been climbing for so long. Um, but yeah, as someone who does enjoy that, I think hopefully I'm going to enjoy that whilst doing the, the entire bike course. Yeah, that's great. Um, so obviously you came out to train to recon for Ironman France. Is uh, there a chance Ironman France is a recon for another Ironman later in the in the season? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me coming out here, I wanted to make sure that I liked the course. I felt like it suited me. And then I felt like there's no better way of wrecking the world championships than doing the entire course pretty much in a race simulation. So to be able to come here, do Ironman France, um, be able to validate for both the Ironman World Championships and the 70.3 World Championships in one race. It seemed like an absolute no-brainer. Um, I already am so happy I've come out here. I've been really enjoying the riding and just getting used to the course. I think it was something that initially scared me a little bit, but I always felt like, you know what, sometimes in life you should just do the things that scare you and that will challenge you and help you to grow, not just as an athlete, but as a person. So that kind of drew me to it and I think that I yeah I'm definitely happy that I've made this decision and just by able to do the entire race in a recce run before coming back and doing the world championships in September I feel like hopefully that's going to help me a little bit well everybody listening except for the female pro uh the female pros that are uh hoping to race uh, in these is pretty excited to hear that that's uh that's Certainly, certainly big news. And, and again, like we were talking earlier about St. George, like you are just so good on a variety of courses and tough courses that, uh, you know, as confident as any, uh, elite female would be, they would have to be kind of terrified that the defending champion is going to go on a course that, you know, it's hard to say it's tougher than Kona, but it takes more time. So like you can infer that it is going to be tougher. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so are you like, does that, I know it's been a long season with the injuries and all that, but does that really help also like define the season, right? Like I imagine you've kind of just been kind of floating a little bit, right? Yeah, for sure. I feel like I've been obviously just building throughout the season, being able to really build up that run mileage. Obviously there's, there's a distance of running per week that I feel like I need to hit to be confident that I can run a good marathon off of riding that distance. So it's taken me a while to kind of get to the point where I'm like, you know what, I'm confident in my body. I'm confident that I'm hitting that mileage. Um, And now I feel like I'm in a position where I can come back and try and defend that title that obviously has felt like such a journey to just get that title. Um, So to be able to defend it, I feel like really happy that I've, I've got that opportunity and I'll be able to try and do that. Oh, so stoked. Uh, as a fan and someone who's been able to be right there for your two world championship, uh, wins and the Ironman scene, I was, uh, yeah, I'm so to hear that. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. And, and, you know, you mentioned that this also then does validate for you to go back to 70.3 world. Is that, um, have you looked at the, the course in Topa and like, are you, uh, excited and, you know, air quotes committed to, uh, to going down 70.3 worlds as well. Yeah. I mean, I definitely would love to. And I think just by obviously validating here, I will have the option to race there. It's going to be a really, really long season. So I don't want to say that I'm a hundred percent committed to racing there. It will also be sure. late in December. I think it's actually on my wedding anniversary. So, uh, I'll have to check with Reese that it's okay for me to race again. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll just see how the season goes. I've never been to New Zealand either. So it's somewhere that I would love to go and visit and race. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to see awesome. how the season plans out. Awesome. Well, I saw Reese giving a thumbs up in the background. So I think you're, I think you're good to go. Um, no, that's awesome. And yeah, let's talk about a little bit about, you know, the validation process uh, has been, you know, has changed and evolved over the years. And Am I right in that if you've won a world championship in the previous five years, you get like an automatic qualification, but you then have to still validate by, or in the past, you've had to validate by doing a race of that distance? Yeah, for sure. So um, in the past, um, obviously being on the podium, I always had to validate um, to to get back to the world championships. And then once you win a world title, you kind of get this five-year grace period where you just have to validate to come back 
Um, we're also in a, a really fortunate position this time where you could choose between doing two 70-point frees or a full distance to validate. Um, and yeah, I've opted to to do the full distance this time around um, on the same course. So yeah, I think that's a pretty smart way of doing it. Yeah, that's sweet. And it's it's cool to see. And, and I know the pros have been talking with Ironman and there was a lot of back and forth. And now kind of the new thing is to be able to qualify without having to do a 70.3 uh, in that same year if you do an iron distance race. And it's, you know, it's this balance, right? Like we want to make sure everybody's still fit, but we want to make sure, you know, if you, for instance, your calf is a little, uh, that we're not forcing you to like, add more races because we want you to get there to defend the title, not just to get around, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that makes sense for, for all the athletes when you're coming to these major races. You don't just want to be there to finish the race. You want to be there being competitive and seeing how you stack up against the best women in the world. So it does make complete sense. And you want everyone that's on that world championship start line, they're ready to give absolutely everything. So yeah, I think we're all going to be in the best position to do that. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Kona, if you don't mind. I know it uh, was a, a long journey for you to get that that first first win. How many uh, how many attempts at Kona have you had, and, and how have those goes? How have the, had those gone until that uh, till that win? Yeah, well, I guess the first time I set foot um, in Kona was in 2015 as an age grouper, um, taking on what felt like, I guess, a once in a lifetime opportunity to step foot on the big island and, right. and race the Ironman. Um, and then I never really even thought in that moment that I would come back and compete um, professionally. It wasn't until um, I took my pro license in 2016 and came back and watched Reese compete in Kona. Um, and I remember watching the pro women come out of the water there thinking, I really want to be doing this next year. Like it would be a dream come true to just be in the pro field, seeing if I could make it uh, just to Kona, just to line up against those women. And then to come second in 2017 was just mind blowing. I, I remember it's probably still, I, I wouldn't say it beats winning it, but it was close because I just could <laughs> not believe it. Like it just blew my mind um, being, I think I was only 23 at the time. So, um, or maybe I just turned 24 and I just could not believe it. And then I, I think I felt like, well, it must only be a matter of time before I can win this thing because I've, I've rocked up and managed to come second in my rookie attempt. Um, I never thought that I would then come second another three times to make it four second place finishes before I finally managed to get the win last year. So it has been one hell of a, of a journey. It's been a roller coaster. There's been ups, there's been downs, there's been injuries. Um, but yeah, it just... I knew last year that I had to win it or that might I might not do it. So I think despite the injury that I kind of sustained um, just before the race that then exploded on the marathon, I feel like it wouldn't have mattered what happened to me. I could have lost my leg. I would have just hopped to the finish. Like I just, there was no way I was going to stop. Right. So um, yeah, one hell of a journey and still means so much to have got that win last year. Oh uh, yeah. So, so impressive. And that consistency, I think in elite sport, it just doesn't happen. Like people talk about that in bike races, like Tour de France or whatever, like everything has to happen. Everything has to go correctly every time. Right. And if people pay attention to you and throughout the season, going into these races, it does not go smoothly all the time. Right. Like you've had a history of having these injuries that you've dealt with and to have that consistency is uh, amazing. What do you think allows you to have, clearly you have to have a lot of, focused training but a lot of patience to be able to set yourself up to be there every year in October yeah definitely patience is is one of the key things I think with any sport but obviously with the injuries that I'd had and um I think it was around this time last year actually I I'd broken my foot so I was in a, a moon boot at this time last year so even when I was doing my long run yesterday and it felt tough I was like this time last year you was in a boot like you wasn't even running um, so just got to appreciate when you are healthy and yeah I guess it also gives me a little bit of confidence knowing that I did have that massive injury and then was able to build through until um, until Kona so um, yeah I, I guess as well recently um, I had a health diagnosis um, which I know you know about Matt where I was diagnosed with celiac disease um, and we actually think that a lot of those injuries that I had 
could have been linked to that where I hadn't actually been able to absorb what I've been eating in my diet. So um, I think as well, I feel a little bit better now knowing that I feel healthier and hopefully a little bit more confident in my body as well that I'm not damaging it every day um, by eating the wrong things. So um, yeah, I'm hopeful that that will help as well. Oh, it's it's huge. And uh, for those listening, the reason she said I'm also celiac and I have been for uh, a long time and uh, aware of it. And my nephew pointed it out on Instagram. He's like, Matt, talk to, talk to Lucy. And the first thing I said was, oh man, she is like, you're the injuries. And that is, you know, it's not a thing of the past, but the consistency of those injuries is going to change greatly with basically your body just doesn't yeah absorb nutrients that and you're obviously doing everything you can to give your body what it should but you're like putting in this like poison essentially that's not allowing it to uh, absorb right yeah I guess it it's been completely eye-opening and there was a period of time where um back in 2021 actually I did do just the food intolerance test and gluten was quite high up on that yeah. So we decided to just cut that out along with the other foods that were high on that list. Um, and in 2021, I just felt the best I've ever felt. Um, but I, even then, I didn't realize that even if you eat the tiniest amount of gluten, like it doesn't matter if I eat a whole pizza or literally a crumb of gluten, it's going to have the same negative impact. So um, like earlier in my career, I'd go into races carb loading on pizza and pasta not knowing that actually that's entirely my body doesn't want that whatsoever so um yeah it's been quite eye-opening but it makes sense as to why I did feel quite good in 2021 when I made that change um but I guess over the years I've just right. kind of flurried with it and just thought oh well I feel a bit rubbish if I eat gluten but actually now I realize that yeah I probably shouldn't have been eating any of that uh, or I definitely shouldn't have so um yeah that's been a little bit of a journey in itself as well but um I think it, loads of people like oh it's so hard that you've got to cut out these foods but I think actually as an athlete we're constantly making sacrifices to help with our performance and for this one to be even more important because it's my health um I feel like it should be quite an easy change to make yeah and it'll take a little bit uh but it's nowadays it's certainly a lot easier I mean like when I when I was diagnosed I was 25 and I remember going on a long ride with my brother like the week after and I was just eating like rice cakes. Like I didn't know what to eat. <laughs> so like literally on this long ride, he took me to the doctor's office. It was like, you ruined my brother. He can't ride his bike anymore uh, because I like just couldn't figure out what I needed to eat. Where nowadays there's so many great, you know, gluten-free recipes and gluten-free products that you can get off the shelf that it's uh, pretty easy to to avoid. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I feel quite lucky that although it probably has had a negative impact on me growing up. Um, I feel like quite lucky now that there are so many more options around and actually there's some really good gluten-free cake. So um, that was the main thing I was really upset about that I might not be able to eat cake anymore, but I've, I've found some good gluten-free cake out there, which um, yeah, has made life a bit better again. That's awesome. So for what it's worth, I looked at shipping cookies because I have this world-renowned my own special gluten-free chocolate chip cookie recipe, but it was like 200 euros to get, <laughs> to get you cookies. And I was like, I don't think we have the budget yet. It's early in the podcast. <laughs> uh, but I will, I will make you a batch, uh, in, in Nice and I'll, I'll get you, uh, I'll get you some of Matt's world famous gluten-free cookies because you'll never want that to go back. And I'll send you the recipe. Yeah, <laughs> Thank sure. you. Um, but really it is, uh, I'm super stoked because I like every athlete knows that the injury, roller coaster is like an emotional one. And I think this obviously should balance things out, but like, that's what to me is so impressive about all those second places. And then to see you get that win. Like, I mean, let's, let's talk about, and I want to talk about the rest of your race, but, and I think you've done a pretty good job. And certainly during the race, like you didn't over hype that injury. You didn't talk about it beforehand, but like, I got word in the middle of the marathon from uh i think it was from from caden or somebody on course uh that was like hey lucy's got a calf tear and i'm like what the heck i'm like and i go and i try to to find you and i saw um reese but i before i saw reese i spent five minutes beh like directly behind you on a moto 
and looking at, I'm like, and I could not, I couldn't decide which leg it would have been if you had a calf tear because you were not like your stride did not change at all. And I like called those people back. I'm like, there's zero chance she has an injury because I just watched her for five minutes. And then I caught up with reason. He, he told me about it. How, how in the world could you push through that pain? And for those that didn't see, like you couldn't, you were on crutches the next two days. Like you couldn't walk, right? Like how did you push through that pain and still run that to win? Is it just this like light at the, at the finish line? It's crazy. Yeah. I think maybe in any other race, I would have stopped because I knew I was doing damage in that moment, but the journey I'd been on and being second four times and the injuries that had come in between that, I was like, this might be my best and last shot to win this race. Um, if I never race again, I want to have won this race, which seems extreme, but that race meant everything to me. So I guess I don't even know if I can even go back into the mental space that I was in that race. Um, when I spoke to my coach, Dan, afterwards, he said, I think there's only like so many times in your career that you can do that to yourself, take yourself to that space. Um, and I would definitely agree. It was mile one on, on the Kona Marathon where I just felt like the no entire way. calf just tore. Um, and I remember getting onto Alihi Drive and every single person on there was like, willing me to win they said it was they were like this is your day you're gonna do this and I internally I was just like screaming like you've got no idea what I'm going through in this moment um and I just knew I just had to just keep putting one foot in front of the other and move forward and I would look at my pace and be like oh my pace is actually bang on what we wanted um even though I'm in agony so what does it matter it's just pain um you're still going exactly to plan um, so if you can just try and block out the pain and and just go with the pace. Um, and there was definitely times where the pain got worse. So I would have to just ease back a little bit and then the pain would get less and I could push it on again. But then it felt like it came back worse. So, um, yeah, internally I was having this unbelievable kind of mental battle to just keep going. But, um, yeah, I guess towards the end, I remember seeing Reese. I think I, I came out of the energy lab and maybe had like eight or nine K left. And he was like, have we got this? And I was like, yeah, I've got this. Like I have not come this far through this much pain to stop now. Um, and I, and I remember that obviously the gap behind me was coming down. I had probably one of the strongest runners in the sport, Annie Howe chasing me down. Um, and I was yeah. just like, not this time like she's she's overtaken me before late in that marathon and I just was like not today like even if I guess my biggest fear was um Polani going back down because I was just like yeah you've just got to take this bit really slow because this could be like disaster um so yeah there was a huge fear and I think also like I didn't slow down once I was on a leaky drive even going up the finish line I, I didn't high five anyone which it's something I regret, but I was like, I don't even know if I'm going to get there. Like I just had to get across no. that finish line. Um, and yeah, it, it was crazy. Like I still can't even believe I've done it sometimes. Sometimes I wake up and have to remind myself that I did do it, but, um, yeah, it was insane. Well, and what's insane about it is like, I knew, right. Cause I talked to Reese and I think when I asked him off camera, he used a word I can't repeat on like, how's your calf? And it was like, it's not very good uh uh for the pc language and so after the race i'm like holy crap like i watched this woman run and never show on the face never show it in the stride um the calf and i the polani thing like for those that don't know if you have a calf injury and i did too i think maybe it's a celiac thing or whatever but running downhill if your calf is tweaked like it can just go and you can't like it is the worst the worst position to be in uh, if you have a calf tear is to have to run down any hill, let alone Pilani, because nobody wants to run down that hill. But for me, like after the race, I'm like, guys, isn't that crazy that Lucy pushed through all this pain? And like, you held it so well that nobody believed me or thought it was important because they're like, no, she was totally fine. Like, I just, uh, how are you, how, I just still don't get where you can put, like, I'm good at pushing through pain, but pushing through pain where like, you're not showing it in stride length or like you weren't leaning over more to use your glutes. Like, did you go to a different place 
in your head to like just eat it or was it just I've done too much to get here and I need to get to the finish yeah I think I mean part of maybe where the the game face was coming from was that I was really focused on that calf like just all my attention was going to that and I guess also I I actually think I was running slightly different to how I've normally run it it looked good like even when I watched it back I'm like you would never know but I feel like my form was actually slightly cautious maybe like I wasn't really going for it how I would have been running in my training beforehand and I just feel really fortunate that my running had been going well beforehand in the race I think if it hadn't then obviously I wouldn't have had like a fallback with having an injury I think it just allowed me maybe to have a little bit of a cushion because running had been going so well before but I still yeah. like in training if something hurts I'm like right we must stop immediately like there's no way in case I make this worse but in that scenario it was like just just keep going like do not stop yeah it's just insane like I, I I've I tweaked my calf I didn't run in a lot of years because I had a hip replacement and I tweaked my calf like a light tweak like I stopped running 30 seconds after it tweaked and I was limping for a week and I haven't run since and that was a month ago so to run a marathon at that pace through it is bananas but so on the race up until that point was that like you said you had tweaked it a little bit did that affect your uh tactics in the race at all because like like you were gave yourself quite a gap like talk us through that kind of that swim and that and that bike and where your head was then compared to the okay i've gotten second fourth place which is crazy consistent and amazing but like i don't want that again yeah i think my tactics were really similar to the years before i know that my strength is definitely on the okay. swim and on the bike so i knew that i had to use that and i guess i i tried to not let any negative creep in about knowing that i had a, a slight niggle on the run and i almost told myself how well the running had been going before that happened like a week out from the race I was like you were running so well like you have to back yourself you have to back your run um and then knowing obviously when I got off the bike I knew I had a really good cushion to the to the really strong runners um so I knew that I didn't have to run a crazy fast run split to get the win I just had to run something that was completely within me um and yeah I guess that probably helped a little bit knowing I didn't need to push it if probably if I'd had to push it it probably would have been <clears throat> it probably would have had to it would have been too much like it probably would have got to the point right. where maybe the two muscles completely came apart like that was one of the things when after the race when I eventually when I got the calf looked at um I actually went to um I was basically a guinea pig for a day I went to a college where they were all studying uh, MRI scans um and they were oh I think it was actually ultrasound scans so they had the ultrasound on my calf they were moving my foot and they were saying actually you were so incredibly lucky because although the tear went all the way downward somehow the muscles are still functioning together um and maybe if I just pushed it too much they wouldn't have functioned together and then the leg wouldn't actually have been able to run anymore so although they were completely shocked that I had run a marathon with it in that state they were like maybe the Hawaiian gods were there (laughs) keeping it just about functioning so that you could finally get that win and it definitely it felt a little bit like that on that day that I know they talk about Madame Pele but it felt like maybe she was like, you're so stubborn. You've come back for the fifth time, but I'm going to make it tough for you. If you really want to win this, I'm going to challenge you to your absolute limit. And it, it really felt like she did do that. And I guess for me, it feels like winning it, it would have been enough to just have to wait five times to finally win it. But it means even more knowing what I went through on that day to get the win. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. And I, I think it speaks to how you carry yourself. And obviously the second places will get people on your side and kind of racing from the the front people enjoy that but um if i'm being honest with you like that win in st george and that win in kona me personally like i was like you know i'm always i don't have any favorites but i'm like holy crap like she's doing it and it like this is awesome and like everyone else in the finish shoot in that area like they are they're always excited for the champion, but it seemed to be up a level. Like that everybody was so stoked that you won in St. George the way you did. And everybody was like, so ecstatic that you won in Kona. Do you, do you have any thought as to what, 
what that is or why why you might have that that kind of response i guess yeah a lot of people would have felt that built up frustration maybe that i had even though i don't feel like i really showed it i was always incredibly proud of all of those Mm. second place finishes but maybe a lot of people felt like they were on that journey with me and were like when is it going to be her time to win this race um and obviously i do share a lot of my journey online as well i try and be open with the the highs and the lows sharing the injuries that i have so people knew that it hadn't been the smoothest journey to that start line again um so i really did feel that like i felt like i had their energy on that run and everyone out there was willing me to win that day and i i felt maybe a bit more pressure as well to do it that day because i really felt that energy that everyone was just willing me on to win so to do it and have that energy as well i think it just means so much as well and I feel incredibly grateful to have so many people supporting me, obviously within my team, but also in the wider team and the community as well. Like I just feel so much love from the Ironman community. So um, yeah, it felt amazing to be able to win it and and give that back to everyone as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, and you make a good point. Like I think uh, what's interesting about all the second places is like I've literally, and I've tried to get it out of you in interviews. Like you'd be like negative about it. Like, ah, crap, I want to win. Like every time you're like, I'm stoked. That's the best I could have done. I'm really pleased with it. And I think people realize that and that humility that's within that and like the work that goes around that. And, uh, yeah, well-deserved obviously. And, uh, so, uh, building into, you know, possibly two more world championship bids is anything, I mean, there's been lots of changes, any changes besides nutrition and uh moving things forward as far as making sure your body can uh you know adapt to that you know new diet with the the celiac yeah i think that's definitely been the biggest change um i think one of my biggest goals really for this year before i even found out that i was celiac was just to try and stay healthy for a whole year it's been difficult in the last two years so um yeah that was a big goal of mine just just try and stay healthy and and see what you can do in a healthy body and now to to have that diagnosis and feel every day a little bit healthier a little bit stronger um already seeing progression in my training in the right direction I think it's it's been really eye-opening but it just gives me a, a bit of confidence knowing that I'm in a healthy body um I think also getting the win in Hawaii last year just kind of took off this internal pressure that maybe I had to get that win I just feel like I've been enjoying training so much more this year just doing it for the love of doing triathlon rather than having and wanting to get that win so um I'm hoping that's gonna just give me a little bit more energy as well I feel a lot less stressed and yeah just just able to train for the enjoyment and love of doing this sport that's so awesome and you found great spots to do it obviously uh finding uh the South of France to be able to get around and, and train. And I'll say, I'm sure right now, once the podcast goes live, there's going to be a, a rush on tickets to Nice to watch you kind of defend that title. And I mean, I'll tell you what, and I think you felt it too. Yeah. Let's tell us about the, the difference on the women's only race. Like it felt that, that race in Kona, like that week leading into it, it felt like a warm hug. Like everybody was like, high five in each other and like everybody wanted each other to do the best that they could on the day. Can you tell us like did that? Did you feel that energy as well? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, since I've, I've been in this sport since around, I guess, 2014, 2015 and the women's side of this sport has just grown and gone from strength to strength since then. So to have just a women only day was just incredible. But like you said, that feeling before the race, there was just so much joy and happiness and everyone wanting each other to do well. And then out on the course, like I remember descending back from Harvey and going in the other direction. And I'd say like nearly every single woman cheered for me during their race and just, right. you just don't get that in any other sport, I don't think. So um, yeah, it's just incredible to have so many strong women across age group to professional in this sport. And yeah, um, yeah, I'm hopeful that we can kind of just continue that legacy and inspire more and more women to to give this crazy sport a go. Well, no doubt the way that you uh, carry yourself and your performances uh, is continuing to inspire uh, women to to give their best and uh, what they can do, to see what they can do in triathlon and iron, iron distance racing. So appreciate that. And Lucy, appreciate so much your time uh, coming on 
the podcast and so excited to hear that you're going to be uh, in Nice. The validation goes okay and uh, look forward to watching you at Ironman France. Yeah, I'm so excited. It's going to be a new challenge, a uh, new course. And yeah, I can't wait to give it my best in a couple of weeks and then yeah, get ready for the big one in September. Awesome. Well, can't wait to see it. And uh, again, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks. Well, there you have it, Lucy, an absolute legend. And being honest, when I say like being a part and seeing her win, it, you really did feel like everybody wanted her to win both those races. Um, and so it's great to see her get that world championship title and stoked to hear that she's going back to defend. It's going to be going to be awesome to watch. And, you know, as the rest of our pro series has been pretty, pretty dramatic at times, a lot of stuff has been happening, uh, a lot of great racing and our next races in the series will be at Ironman 70.3 Boulder this upcoming weekend and Cairns airport, Ironman Asia Pacific championship Cairns. And I'm pretty excited about both of those. I'm going to be on the ground, uh, giving you, uh, more insider looks at what's happening behind the scenes at those races. Pretty excited about those. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please like share and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you're sitting on the trainer, you can also watch the podcast as a video on our Ironman triathlon YouTube channel. And to stay up to date on uh, the latest Ironman Pro Series news, follow Ironman Tribe on Instagram and check out proseries.ironman.com for standings, athlete bios, episodes of the Fighting Chance, and replays of the races and more. And, you know, we've said, uh, you know, we had two of the best athletes on the planet, obviously, uh, coming in to defending world championships, uh, winners. And those are both Morton athletes. And we can't say a big enough thanks to our presenting sponsor, Martin. They're the official sports performance nutrition partner of the Ironman Global Series. And in 2023, both Sam and Lucy, Charles Barkley, fueled their world championship victories with Martin's hydrogel technology. It's the innovation that enables athletes to consume more carbohydrates at race intensity with less risk of stomach discomfort. And all Ironman athletes actually have access to Martin hydrogels and solids on course in 2024. So thanks again to Martin for everything that they do for all the athletes on the Ironman scene and the global series, but also specifically uh, for this podcast, we can't do it without them. So thank you as well for listening in and joining us on our second Ironman insider podcast presented by Martin and be sure to keep an eye on this space for may more great conversations with the big season ahead and good conversations with the best athletes in the sport. I'm Matt Lieto and thank you so much for tuning in.